Patricia and John had been courting for months, and they were deeply in love. He was the son of a shop owner, and she was the daughter of a retired general. Her parents didn't approve of him, saying she deserved more than he could provide, and he was determined to prove them wrong. It was late 1917, and the United States had just entered the Great War. Eager to impress what he hoped would be his future father-in-law, John rushed to join the army and head off to Europe. Patricia was devastated at the news and begged him not to go. He promised to return to her, giving her a necklace that had once been his grandmother's and telling her to hold it close until they could be together again. As he boarded the train to leave, tears poured from her eyes. It was a beautiful, sunny day in early March of 1918 and he watched her wave and blow him kisses as he rolled off to start his journey. Arriving in Camp Lee, Virginia, John soon found himself doing some of the most grueling work he had ever done. There was the physical aspect, of course, but a lot of it was mental as well. He was always exhausted, and he missed Patricia dearly. The barracks were cold at night, a wool blanket the only barrier between him and the frost that layered everything. It took weeks for the trainees to get the proper gear, and even then, it wasn't very good. On more than one occasion, John wondered if he had made the right decision after all. By late April, he found himself being shipped out with hundreds of others, destined for the front lines in France. He was told that he would be part of what they were calling the First Division, nicknamed the Big Red One. As they arrived in Paris, the reality of where he was started to sink in. Attached to an infantry unit, John spent a lot of time marching around France, fighting the Germans at every turn. Between firefights, he would write letters to Patricia about what life was like on the front lines and how he couldn't wait to see her again. She would write back from time to time, but mail was slow and he barely noticed when the letters stopped coming. On November 11th, 1918, a treaty to end the war was signed, and John was excited to finally be headed home. He had seen the worst side of humanity, losing several friends along the way, and he was ready to put the war behind him. The trip back to the States was much slower than the journey to the front lines had been, with a lot of waiting around and canceled ships. Even when things seemed to be moving quick, it was much slower than anyone wanted. Months passed, and John hadn't even made it out of Europe. Just when he thought he couldn't take the waiting anymore, his name was called for a ship to finally take him home. The journey was even worse than the first trip had been, mostly thanks to a storm that tossed the ship about near the middle of the Atlantic. Finally, the ship docked in New York, and John smiled as he stepped on American soil once more. He closed his eyes and soaked in the smells and sounds of the city. For the first time in over a year, everything seemed right with the world. Hoping to make it back to his love in Ohio as soon as possible, John started searching for some transportation. He had saved most of his salary, just over $400, and he wanted something grand to return with. As he walked along the streets, Eyeing the windows of various shops, he saw exactly what he was looking for. A brand new Harley Davidson J-Twin. He'd seen a man riding a motorcycle once a few years prior, and he had decided then and there that he would own one at some point. It was almost as if fate was stepping in to grant his wish, especially since it was listed at $300. After filling out some paperwork and paying the dealer, he set out to make his way back to Patricia. The trip would only take a couple of days, and he would soon see the sign welcoming him back to Elmore, Ohio. He stopped for a few minutes to see his parents, who couldn't stop saying how proud they were of him, before heading to Patricia's house on the edge of town. As he drove, he wondered if he would even recognize her after so much time. For that matter, would she recognize him? It had been months since her last letter, and he wondered if she had received his note about when he would be returning. After all he had been through, 
He was sure her father would approve of him now, and they would finally be able to be married. As he pulled into the driveway, he straightened his hair and climbed off the bike. Walking up to the door, he knocked and waited with a big smile on his face. It would only be a couple of minutes before it opened. A man John didn't recognize stood in the doorway, a puzzled look on his face. After a brief pause, he asked if John needed anything. Trying to look past the man, John said he was there to see Patricia. The look on the man's face grew more puzzled as he looked back over his shoulder and yelled for her. After about 30 seconds, the man stepped back inside as Patricia appeared, stepping out onto the patio and closing the door behind her. John could tell something was wrong based on the look in her eyes, but it didn't take long for him to notice something else. On her left hand, she wore a ring. A small bump in her midsection told him it was more than just a piece of jewelry. His heart sank into his stomach and his brain shut out most of what she was saying as she apologized for not telling him. His legs were on the verge of melting beneath the weight that now sat on him. She said she still wanted to be friends, that she cared about him very much, but none of that mattered. Grabbing his hand, she placed something in his palm. As he pulled away, he saw his grandmother's necklace looking back at him. His face turned red, and he hurled the necklace into the yard. Turning, he started walking back to his motorcycle, fighting the tears. She called after him, nearly crying herself, but he refused to turn around. Everything he had done, everything he had given up, how could she? Climbing back onto the bike, he started the engine and revved it. Tearing out of the driveway, he sped down the road into the night, no longer caring about anything. His eyes started to fill with the tears he had been blocking, blurring his vision. Faster and faster he went, pushing the machine to its limit. There was nothing left for him. Approaching a bridge he had crossed too many times to count on his way to see her, he started sobbing and the bike started to wobble. Pushing the accelerator down as far as he could, he lost control and found himself careening into the rail of the bridge before falling over the edge. The bike tumbled onto the bank of the river, landing in a mangled heap that rested partially in the water. He could see it lying there, resting next to his body, as he realized he was floating down the river. As he started to lose consciousness, Patricia's face filled his mind and he drifted off into what felt like a deep sleep. His eyes opened and he found himself on his bike once more. The moon shone bright overhead and he was sitting in Patricia's driveway, but she was nowhere to be seen. As he wondered what was happening, he saw headlights flashing just up the road followed by the sound of a horn honking three times. He knew that was his cue. Starting the engine, he tore out of the gravel drive, speeding down the road toward the bridge. This time, he would get past it. This time, he would stay focused. As he approached, he began to feel the familiar pull of the handlebar. Before he could cross, he was airborne. He saw his body lying next to the Harley before Patricia's face took over as he died again. A horn honking in the distance woke him. Lights flashing, flying through the air, Patricia's face. One more ride and he'd be free.